Hello and welcome to the Coaching Podcast, coaching for success in sport and business. Your host is Emma Doyle, the energy and high performance under pressure coach who is a world leader in unleashing human potential. Buckle up for this high octane session. Let them have it, coach. G'day, everybody, and welcome to the Coaching Podcast. I am here with Jules Hay. She's the Participation and Inclusion Manager of Rugby in Australia. Background of over 20 years working with education, sports sectors in roles such as Director of Sport, Head of Physical Education, Lecturer of Participation, rah, 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 I will go on, but I'll stop there because she's just an amazing advocate for women in coaching and uh, all things to do with gender equality. Jules Hay, welcome to the show. How are you? Um, good, thanks. And it's so good to see you, Emma. It's been so long um, uh, as one of my coaching mentors. So it's great to catch up officially and have a chat. I'm really looking forward to it. All right. Fantastic. Well, listen, I'm going to kick it off with one of our pattern break questions. And that is, what do you like to have for breakfast on a Sunday morning? That's that's a tough one. Um, usually my weekend go-to is poached eggs on toast with a side of bacon and mushrooms Ooh. from the cafe because I I quite like to have the little, you know, the atmosphere and going to my local cafe and support local business and and then have the nice coffee too, which we were just talking about how good our coffee is here in Melbourne. Correct, correct. And I, I love you. You are all about community, uh, you know, it's, it's in your title, inclusion manager. So let's talk about community sport. Uh, let's talk about what does it mean to be an inclusion manager? Yeah, sure. So I think part of the reason I was attracted to this role um, was because I've always grown up. Mum always says uh, I grew up in Perth uh, on the west side of Australia um, in a in a court, which is uh, for those in America is, I guess, do you call it a court over there? Something cu- Perth got it a cul-de-sac. <laughs> yeah, a cul-de-sac. Much, a yeah, cul-de-sac, that works. Yeah. So, um, and I used to round up all the kids in the street and <laughs> organise them into something, whatever that was we had. I remember growing up with a billy cart. I remember marbles. I remember cricket. Um, uh, so I, I guess from a really young age, I was really heavily embedded in my community. I did. People always um, give me a lot of sort of stick about the fact that I don't know TV shows or songs, and I think that was because I grew up outside in the street, in the park, at the local swimming pool, um, and I think that just really became a part of me, and I loved that. So when I had my own children, um, I really wanted to bring them on a bit of that journey too. Uh, really lucky here in Melbourne. We've got so much community sport. We're spoiled for choice. Uh, so they've been a part of the basketball, surf club, netball, um, footy, Aussie rules footy. They did soccer for a bit. So, you know, it it's a really nice, I think, way to get to know your community, know the people. Um, and then I, after the lockdowns, I went back and worked in a school, which was great. Another great way to get to know my community. Um, and I thought, it was during that time that I thought I really, I just love sport. I really want to think I want to take the step and work in sport. Um, and this job came up and I was like, well, sounds pretty, pretty awesome thing to do all day to work with a community and try to build, as I say, um, for me, it's about building great clubs. Um, and we know that if the club is great, then people will come almost no matter what the sport is because it brings the local community in. They might be driving past or walking the dog and they're like, hey, what's going on there? Oh, there's a barbecue. Oh, I'm going to grab a sausage from the canteen and watch whatever sports on the field. So, uh, yeah, I like I say, I, I think we're blessed here in Melbourne to if you go for a walk on a Saturday or a Sunday or even a weeknight around your local community, you'll see some form of sport being played. And um, that for me is it's that the sense of belonging and 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 connecting with our community and I think like I say to be able to do that for a job is a real privilege Mm. so if you were to do a health check on a uh, building a great club you go into a club what sort of are the the pillars that make up a uh, a great club oh good question I think um for me it's always about your very first experience of the club so quite often now that very first experience is actually online because you might be googling um you know what is in my local area so it's first interaction with the club is jumping usually on their website and having a look and if you see people like you on the website then usually you're going to be like oh that looks like 
an interesting place to go. I might go down. And then I think that next really important step, the very first experience of the face-to-face meeting at the club. So making sure that someone's there to meet you, greet you, make you feel welcome. Usually uh, I know in particular a lot of girls and women are perhaps a little bit nervous about heading down to a club, especially if they don't know anyone. So if they know when I get there someone's going to make me feel welcome, explain to me what to do. Um, And recently, actually, I had a really great experience at a rugby club um, where I was new to playing rugby. And one of the women in the team just was like, Jules, come with me. And then she sort of buddied up with me the whole training session. And I thought, to me, that was like the real sort of um, penny dropping moment of if we have someone, and I think whether you're man, woman, boy or girl, if there's one person that sort of takes you under their wing the very first time you go down and helps to explain the drill or helps go over here and do this, that that to me was, it just made it a really awesome experience. And um, I think that was the, the key is just having that one person that, you know, wraps their arms around you and says, hey, welcome to the club and here's what you're doing. And so you can ask, you feel safe to ask them some of the things that you don't know. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, of course, some of our listeners are in the business world and everything you just said then is uh, equally as important in terms of what makes a great business. Uh, I work a a lot in manufacturing these days and when you walk into a shop or when you experience uh, that that first um, that first moment for someone to take you under their wing, and I I love this whole thing about belonging. If if I can see someone who looks like me, so why is that important, especially for one of your passion areas and and my passion areas around uh, women and girls in in sport and in coaching? So why is it important for visibility? If I talk to my lived experience, um, having been an athlete coach. Uh, on the committee, referee, et cetera, is that the most powerful thing to go into a club or a sport or a business is to feel like, first of all, self-worth, like you're visible and you're seen. And then I think, secondly, that your voice is heard. So no matter whether that's for something small, like good morning when you first walk into the office or you know, if you come to the training or to the game, people say hello to you, uh, through to being able to ask questions about how do I do this, through to then having safe conversations on a deeper level about um, perhaps calling something out or seeking clarification. So if we're able to do that, then, and I guess that is much easier to do initially with people who look like us, sound like us, hear our voice, then we're more in, feeling more encouraged and more supported from the very start. Mm. Thank you for sharing those really important messages so far of how we can all do a better job uh, because certainly, correct me if I'm wrong, when I think about rugby or, or even AFL, AFLW to some degree, uh, there might be a little bit of stigma out there that it's just a sports for boys. So what what's your comment to that? Yeah, so one of the things that we're working on behind the scenes um, at rugby at the moment um, is this myth busters. So we w- really want to come up with sort of some statements around myth busters. And we know that um, in our community in Australia, um, those contact sports like AFL and rugby, where there's a bit of a myth that they're not really suitable for girls and for women. Um, and we know that in actual fact, when we take, I actually, a couple of years ago, I was coaching under 10 girls, um, footy, AFL footy. And when I went around the circle and said to them after the very first game, um, what's your favourite thing? What do you love about this sport? Um, it was like nine in 10 of them said t- the tackling. So we know that little girls just love the physicality. They love to grab someone and pull them down to the ground, whether that's footy or rugby. Um, and so I think that, you know, first it gives them confidence. Like why not is the question, it, it, you know. And and we know that, um, you know, that if women are feeling and girls are feeling confident in their, in their selves, that just has a whole pile of other knock-on effects in their life. So I think um, trying to break down the stigma 
around the contact is super important. Um, and the other thing is that I will just say as a coach, um, for those who might be thinking, oh, I don't think I could do that because it's, you know, I don't play a contact sport and I don't want to jump straight into getting tackled is that good coaches are able to scaffold it. So you you don't come down as a beginner and then just get thrown to the ground. The idea is the coach is that you are able to scaffold the contact and whether, you know, quite often at um, whether it's footy or rugby, we might have contact, uh, trainings or drills that are non-contact. And if, so if you're feeling a little bit hesitant as a woman or a girl, then we can start you off um, with the non-contact version and then we can slowly increase the contact level because I think that's part of the myth too is that people, so they might see the elite level of the game that might be a huge contact between two players and they think, oh, I could never do that. And it's, it's really important that what we... Uh, advocate for as coaches is that we scaffold the level of contact in our contact sports to the level of our athletes and so if you are a beginner certainly come on down and get involved because the coaches can um you know ease you in gently to the contact and I and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised that you know we we're all pretty uh we're pretty flexible when we get thrown on the grass and that it's actually if you've never been contact, you know, tackled before, it's actually quite a fun thing to do. And you surprise yourself. When I was down at the rugby the other night, I was a little bit hesitant myself. I got taken out. I was like, actually, it's not so bad. And we we sort of, I think we probably build up a bit of fear in our own minds. So which is breaking down that fear and saying, oh, that wasn't too bad. And I've got to say, it certainly came in um, handy. A, a couple of years ago, I went for a run in the dark and I tripped over on the concrete and I automatically just rolled. And I thought, oh, my God, that's all that training I've done, um, you know, on the footy field that I'm able to react. So it certainly has some transferable skills into our life then um, if we do have a trip or a spill that we're used to, you know, because I think that's it too as, as a woman or at, once we step away from sport, we don't have that contact. And so it's... It, we we form a bit of a safety net around ourselves. So it's pushing our own barriers back to feel confident to hit the ground on the grass and say, actually, that was that was pretty fun and I enjoyed that. Mm. Well, you heard it, everybody. Let's uh, all get <laughs> stretch our comfort zone and, <laughs> you know, it's same in martial arts. <laughs> and, and martial arts as well, isn't it? But I, I want to yeah. pick up I want to pick up on the word scaffolding because it's not something I hear a lot, um, but I love it because I use it a lot in, in to, you know, progress, regress, but also, especially in the business world, it's about meeting people where they're at is something that I really heard there. And I think that is, that's super, super critical for coaches listening. I know it sounds obvious, but sometimes we make assumptions. Yeah. What we are some assumptions? And we have expectations, right? Yeah. And, and I... I think that's in the workplace and in the coaching context. So we expect, we often look at somebody's CV or somebody's, like I coach under 14 boys, uh, and we expect them to be at a certain level. And so sometimes as a manager or as a coach, we can be blinded by that because we just automatically, like you say, assume that they're going to come in with those that set of skills or that level of knowledge and then in actual fact, it takes a little bit of time for us to unpack that and then realise, oh, I set the bar too high. I need to go back, re-scaffold this and then bring them up on the journey. Uh, one of my favourite. Uh, actually, Emma, that, that, yep. we were talking about the COVID lockdowns and that's probably one of the things too that's been a real um, eye-opener for me here in Melbourne because we were locked up for two years um, and community sport was uh, banned for two years. And I see in our children that the fundamental movement skills, there is a delay in development. And so what we would, pre-COVID, what we would expect our kids to be at the level of skill is actually now sort of all re messed up because some kids kept up this you know, this one-on-one -on -one or their uh, skills during COVID with parents and others did, the other end of the spectrum is some did nothing. And so all of a sudden now when we're coaching kids, the, the you know, the differentiation between the kids who are quite strong and mastered skills versus the kids who perhaps didn't do much over the COVID era is uh, huge. And then ties into that with something else you and I were just talking about um, off camera is that piece around mental health and confidence and of course as an athlete um, that has a massive knock-on effect to performance so 
for coaches, um, there's a lot to manage. And probably that does transfer over to the workplace too, that we constantly have to, you know, adjust and say, where is this person at today? When they come to work or when they come to training, how are they today? You know, and that sometimes we have to, the expectation has to be put aside and we have to really work one-on-one with that person to support them in the moment. Well, you hit the nail on the head in the moment. I mean, I really think that being present is sometimes a lost art. And as coaches, if we're not present, we're going to miss all the cues and we're going to miss all the signs to be able to to meet them where they're at. So just a great reminder, Jules, for us to, before we go out and coach or leaders and managers listening to this, before you go into a meeting, if you can just take one or two minutes to to gather yourself to compartmentalize as well. Sometimes what's going on in our life and our world, put that aside so we can be fully present to, to pick up on those cues. Otherwise we miss those cues. I think I'm certainly guilty of this sometimes too, as a manager and as a coach that we go in to those meetings or um, training session or game with a plan. And then what, can happen is if we're too focused on the plan, like you say, that's when we can miss the cues of the moment. There is a moment where you go, you know what, plan to the side and we're going to, guys, throw it out. We're re, this is what we need right now. This is what the team needs or this is what the individual needs. And so I really agree with you about it's important to plan, but of course we have to be, if we're not present, that we're almost blinded by our planning. So we've got to sort of flip that flip that notion of have the plan but be present, which can be really challenging if you're, particularly if you're new to managing or to coaching because you're trying to obviously lean into the plan that you set. And I think probably that the other question is when do you throw the plan out? You know, like so we talk about being present because that's a risk then and that's hard and you've got to back yourself and have the confidence to go, I recognise the plan I had is not going to work at this point present moment in time so now I'm going to take the risk and we're going to change it in in the moment and I think that really is about that self-belief in your in your own decision making and standing by it and it doesn't always work I've certainly tried that before and then it's failed but I think that's okay because you know I think that's part of being a leader is sometimes when you make those that take that risk in the moment it's not always going to pay off and that becomes a learning opportunity with your group or with your one-on-one, whoever you're working with, to say, yep, look, I changed my mind. We tried to solve the problem like this. It didn't work. I acknowledge that. And then let's talk about next time we're faced with that, how can we make it better for everyone to get a better outcome? Let's say uh, you've put an improvement plan in place for someone that you're coaching or mentoring and they're not improving at a rate that you would, you know, to hit their KPIs or at a level that your club uh, is is all about. W- what's your advice on sort of performance management? Yeah, I don't think you have to stay locked in, you know. Like I think we get so caught up in um, this is the plan or this is the thing and let's follow through all the way to the end. Like you and I, it sort of comes back to what you, we were talking about prior to we started filming about. You said to me, Jules, you've sort of pivoted a lot in your career. And I think, yeah, on the one side I have, and there's certainly a bit in my mind where I go, geez, I have pivoted a lot. But at the same time, by doing that, I've learned a lot. I've worked with so many different types of people and organisations. So I think when we recognise that, that, Perhaps this was the plan or, the you know, these were the KPIs we set and now the environment's changed or the person's changed. Let's not be afraid to change that and update that because COVID's probably a perfect example where, nine, you know, 2019 we had every organisation and business and sport had all these plans set up. No one could have forecast what we was ahead of us. And what happened was people who innovated and changed it in the moment were able to really leverage off some of the great things about, you know, it was a horrific time and and we spoke about that too, but there were some brilliant things that came out of that. Like our ability to quickly pivot onto online and to learn um, and to, you know, like I say, innovate is 
incredible. So it is, I think it comes back to if you recognise that, then don't be afraid to change it and say, hey, this isn't working. Let's rejig it or move in a different direction and let's review constantly to make sure that it's right for you and it's right for the business or the organisation or the team um, because of those shifting things. Uh, and we know we're living in an era where change is happening faster than ever. Totally uh, concur with, with what you just said. So how do you see, how do you help someone see their blind spots? I think through working together. Like I would say, I guess that's the teacher in me is the piece, the piece around education. But to go back a step, they probably have to be ready for that. I think that's probably the critical thing. If if you um, identify that an athlete you work with or a colleague um, perhaps has some blind spots, you know, I, I, I'm quite a direct communicator, as you've probably picked up. And, and in the past, I've tried the direct communication and it ends up in quite a defensive battle. So I think sometimes there's a time and a place to say, what is the best approach if I'm the manager or the coach of the team? How? What's the personality of the person like? Are they going to be receptive to the feedback and then or have the right mindset? And then it's picking the right time and the right style of delivering that feedback to get the behaviour change that you want. And I think I'm certainly guilty of not getting those things right and then it all goes pear-shaped. Um, and it's, you know, it's through experience of making the mistake that you go, geez, yeah, that didn't really work. I didn't really get the desired behavioural change I was hoping for. It's a complicated question to answer when we talk about how do we how do we get people to identify those blind spots and work with you? I think sometimes too it's about not singling out people perhaps and looking at it more broadly from a team uh, perspective and, and trying to bring the team on the journey, you know, and say, okay, this is something that we could all be better at. And also like talking from your own lived experience of how you um, have made mistakes and how you can also grow and learn. And then I think that helps to get, bring people on the journey. Um, so it's less about, I think you have these blind spots and this is how I want you to change. And it's more about the we, like if we do this together, this is how we're going to be able to tackle the issue or we're going to be able to be a better team. Um, and that I think people are less combative than the you, 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 you know, sort of thing. Totally, totally. And big shout out to our golf pennant team, uh, the Turtles, uh, the Northern Golf Division Three women's pennant team that I had the honour of being a part of. Uh, we were Every Turtle Matters, which stood for enthusiasm, teamwork and mental toughness. And we were all about we. Everything was we, we behaviours, we language, uh, so uh, it was an honour to be a part of that that team, and some amazing things transformed in um, in the twenty twenty four season. So uh, nothing makes me happier than talking That's, about turtles. Emma, yeah, it's a really good point. Actually, it's one of my philosophies as a junior coach. Is the, well, actually, even as a senior coach, is why I give every player equal playing time because in a team sport, you're only as good as everybody functioning together as a team. So if you, a lot of coaches will play their best players more time on the field. Um, but the irony of that is you're, you're, you're making the gap bigger between your strongest players and your players that require more development. So a big philosophy of mine, and I actually just was explaining to my boys on the weekend uh, when we had a great win, is that everybody is getting equal playing time because the biggest growth at the moment in our team is the boys who needed more development because they're getting out there and they're playing. And if those boys are getting more development and more playing time, overall our team is much stronger. That if we all help develop together, we're going to be so much stronger. Yeah. So what does creating a positive learning environment look like, sound like and feel like? Yep. So look like I would say um, happy people <laughs> to begin with, <laughs> happy people that interact with each other. Um, and I think they feel safe to voice their opinion, you know, and, and that we feel safe to call out um, 
when we don't agree with someone or that we are able to give feedback in the moment and people, like I just said, was talking about before, people are not getting um, defensive about it, that it's to live it in a way that's respectful in the workplace, professional, um, and that people feel like, okay, and they're able to be heard. Um, and I think it's it's connection. Like if we can, which is really hard to get, especially in the workplace, I think, in a, way, in a funny sort of way, it's probably much easier in a sport environment because there's one strong commonality of you're all there for the sport. Um, and in particular, if you work in a team sport, then like I coach under 14 boys footy, I've got a whole group of 14 year old boys. So they're sort of all at the same similar stages of development. They like the same things. It's much easier uh, in the workplace. It's really challenging because you've got a variety of ages, ex lived experiences, different cultural backgrounds, so many intersectionalities coming in um, that it can be really challenging to get that right. And um, and I haven't always got it right as a team leader. It's really, and I think it is about just listening, continuing to try, um, supporting each other, admitting when you make a mistake and, um, you know, persisting through that. Like the word resilience, I heard you say earlier, um, you know, that there is an element of that in the workplace because it is, it's a lot more challenging to get it right. I ran a corporate uh, day last week with a construction company called Lennar and in the morning we focused on on themes like resiliency and communication and then in the afternoon we embedded that in sport, like a learn through play philosophy using the sport of pickleball. And it definitely... Uh, was there was four different generations within that company, but all of a sudden there was only two out of 41 people who had played pickleball before. So this is an example of through sport, we were still able to bring everyone together because everyone's playing background was, was ground zero. So it sort of stripped away the, uh, all the, uh, again, back to assumptions that we put on people to be able to bring them back uh, for real, for a really awesome, awesome environment. Uh, so, so I just want to stay on positive for a minute. I mean, I think personally, I think the sandwich effect is outdated. So let's take language as an example. Let's let's go there. Uh, what are your thoughts on positive language as it relates to to creating these safe and belonging type of environments? What are some tips? Yeah, I think um, obviously a big one focus at the moment in sport in particular is the non-gendered, the use of non-gendered language. And I think, um, you know, we're moving towards a world where we try to really use that inclusive language more often and, and creating the safe environment to call it out. So the, right. my big philosophy in this, um, which actually comes from my teaching background, one of our really big philosophies when we educate our physical education teachers so they're our uh, like our sport and our health teachers here in Australia is this approach called um, the strengths-based approach and a lot of uh, sports do pick it up as well um, and I love this approach because it's about finding what our strengths are as a group or as a team and then really identifying them and working on them um, and because I think too often it's very easy it's always much easier for people and I think teams and organisations to call out their gaps or their areas for development. Uh, it's much harder for individuals to call out their strengths. And so I think that um, often when I talk to athletes, I um, say, for example, I have to move them to another position in, on, in the game and I know they may not be very happy with that, especially kids. I'll often use the approach to really talk about their strengths as in um, look, we really need you down the back line. We need some speed down there. We need some um, attack. We need some, you know, um, someone who's got a great tackle. You've got a great tackle. And then the child straight away goes, oh, okay. So they sort of came into the mindset with into the conversation of, oh, no, I've been being moved down back. I've done something wrong. And when you talk them through your rationale as to why you're actually moving them down there, I think they're much more receptive to that and they all of a sudden the confidence is oh okay I haven't done something wrong she's actually identified the coach has identified this in me and I'm going over there and I think that's a really nice one that I try to take into the workplace too is identifying the strengths um, and like we talk about language is using that 
you know, what was a great thing that happened in this and how can we build on that or you're really great at this um, because I think people people are okay to talk about. Like if we're making it a bit more comfortable, they're quite happy to then open that conversation up about their strengths. Yeah, absolutely love it. And just to clarify with regards to what I was saying about the sandwich effect, I I just believe that uh, the more authentic we can be in relation to what you just said, the better. So rather than positive, negative, positive, which was certainly something I learned back in the 80s, uh, I would prefer we we go down the path of focusing on the strength and and also here's an area that we're going to continue to work on. I love language like areas for development. This is all really great tips for coaches out there, uh, but we just don't need to give a compliment where it's not due as well. So just keep the authenticity is what I mean by uh, just be mindful of, of the sandwich effect uh, and instead one of my favourite two words and you just – you just summarized my, my TEDx talk, which is the power of next time. So future-based thinking is, is a really great way to, um, to be able to focus on the strengths. And even last week, the one thing that I did well, can I just say, because we're talking about strengths, uh, was just a, a bunch of Venn diagrams where the teams came up with their top three strengths. And then they could see the commonalities of what the different um, parts of the organization do well and what they can count on each other for which I think works really well in the sporting realm as well um so just yeah I I really agree with that Emma I often tell my team um okay we know we're really fast at the ball um you know and we're um for example we're really good at the in if it's even a footy context we're really good at the run three handball so let's use that more and what we need to work on is the aerial game so it's really like giving them the positive praise and then, like you say, phrasing not in a way of them saying, oh, and you're really crap at that. So we're going to, it's like, it's putting it positively as well of we're going to develop this and being, throwing the energy behind that, I think too, is like, Mm. I think because the one thing I always enjoy talking with you is that we bring a similar level of energy to our coaching. And I think you you have to, when you talk about strengths and then when you talk about areas for development, it's also about the energy you put into that conversation and the belief. So when, going back to the example we just talked about before with the one-on-one with the child when I or the athlete, when I've moved them to a different position, they're feeling uncomfortable, they think it's a penalty while they're being played, you know, it's really about me bringing the energy to the conversation and saying, hey, I really believe in you and this is why I'm moving you. And I think... You know, because there's that body language and the kids. We all know that the the, the uh, I've changed from coaching girls back to boys. The boys aren't listening. Once I speak for ten seconds, they've totally switched off. But I know <laughs> it's funny going back to boys. I know that what I've got to bring is more energy to the boys because that's what they're uh, that's what they're picking up on. So if I can say, "Hey, I really believe in you. Let's go out there, do X, Y, Z. This is what you're great at." They're like, "Oh." Okay. And they really feed off that, which is, I think, really important when you're having these conversations. Mm, fantastic. All right. Uh, in one to a maximum of three words, what do you think makes a great coach? Well, I have your book here and I was looking back through, you interviewed me for the back, in the back pages. Um, and I had to remember, because I think, of course, there's a lot of great things um, that m- make a great coach. There's a lot of things that make a great coach. Um, but for me personally, I think the best coaches I've ever had, really clear communicators, um, and then also the relationships. And I think for me, one of the really powerful things about the relationship as a coach, whether you're a coach in the workplace or in the sport context, is those relationships that go beyond the immediate time you work with the athlete or the colleague. So the relationships that go, you know, years and years beyond athletes contacting me back and saying, hey, Jules, you know, I've done X, Y, Z and sharing their celebration with me. Um, That to me is the power of coaching um, and being being able to work and mentor other people is when I hear their success stories many years sometimes down the track from when I've worked from them. And that's the bit that really empowers me and why I love being, um, you know, a, a manager or a coach is just the connection that we once had has triggered something in that person to then keep on going on and keep on in, and and passing it on to the next person, which I think is just an amazing, you know, it's an amazing 
journey to be a part of. Well, I mean, I'm just so honoured to have played a small part in your your journey all those years ago. But just as an example, we caught up with each other in January and, and you've never seen such a big hug. We 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 saw each other. I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> so great to see you. And, uh, yeah, you know, I also appreciate what you said off air, even though I'm not in the sporting world as much anymore, just the impact that we can have, the, the flow-on effect of, uh, you know what it what it really means to to be a coach. Um, we never we we never quite know, but it is one of the greatest honors in the world. Whether you're a leader, whether you're a manager, people will always remember how you made them feel. So um, yeah, I'm a big believer in that. And yeah. the really interesting thing across my years as a teacher, a coach, and a manager, the really strong relationships that you have, the ones you sort of know, and then obviously you keep in contact with things. It's the kids or the people that you didn't know you had an effect on. And I found it really interesting when I've um, either left a school or left a workplace uh, or left a team, a child, often it's been a child because I've worked more in that space, but a child will reach out with a card um, and some really meaningful words and I will be like, wow, I didn't even know I had that impact on that person. And I think they're the like, they're the really big, you know, moments you go, wow, like i did generally didn't real. I didn't think we had. I didn't had much cut through with that person or much influence. And I think they're the moments that, yeah. I re, I have a box. I put them all in, and I sometimes you know open that up and read back through them and go, wow, I remember that moment where I didn't think I had an impact on that child. And look, look at the the letter I got from them at the end of the time I worked with them. That's incredible. So, uh, yeah, I think there, there's that good. Um, uh, I think it's the TEDx talk with the lollipop, the lollipop moment. And I think um, in in that uh, TEDx talk, the, the lecturer talks about he gave someone a lollipop and, and the girl remembered. And I think that's it. I think one of the most powerful things is that we don't realise the impact we have on others. Mm. Um, and so, you know, like when we go into a, as a coach or a leader, that it, it is important, even when sometimes we might feel frustrated or tired or exhausted or burnt out, that we are making an impact on these people's lives and and don't underestimate that because yeah. the power of your energy and your words, you know, it really can change lives. Can. And uh, note, coaches, I love that you've, I call it a confidence trigger list, but, you know, a confidence box so that when your threshold is challenged, which it will be continuously as a leader, manager and coach, that you pull out that box and you reread the impact that you you have and can have uh, just a, a great little extra bonus coaching tip. So many gold nuggets in this uh, in this episode. My final two questions. Um, the next one is: What disruptive idea do you have that would change the coaching landscape in twenty thirty? Yeah, um, for me, having been a, a PE teacher and also um, coached into many sports. I would love to see, uh, we call it here, more cross-pollination of the sports. So I think all too often um, we're in our bubbles in sports and I uh, could actually probably relate this to the workplace as well, that we get in these silos of how we do things um, and and quite often looking outside of that silo at to other businesses or other sports. Um, in particular, in sport, we've got things like Aussie rules, football, soccer, basketball, netball, field hockey, all of those are what we call invasion sports. So a lot of the tactics or drills um, or skills, ideas, warm-up games can all be shared and um, we can come up with such a great toolkit. So I think um, working more with others and looking outside of our little bubble really helps to create best practice. And it's sort of that also to just being open to think differently, which I think that in 2024, in business and in sport, um, with the nature of the challenges that face our world, you know, th things that we haven't yet faced, things like the COVID pandemic, global warming, um, you know, there's quite a significant amount of wars going on around the place. We've got um, cost of living crisis everywhere um, and they impact everything that we do in the workplace and in community sport. So we have to think differently. And I think all too often we just get caught in this same way of thinking, same way of thinking, you know, the autopilot kicks in um, and I'm a big believer that we have to keep learning and we have to keep 
you know, in order, if we've learned sort of a lot of the people in our own workplace or our own business, then go outside, think bigger, think, you know, and grab those like great ideas because there's just so many brilliant minds around doing things differently. So picking up on those and building your own little toolkit, I think will really help. Two things came to mind. Um, my nephew's circus school warm-up games, some of the best I've ever seen. So shout out to uh, Preston Circus School. Uh, highly recommend um, people just go and watch <laughs> the circus. They do it so well collaboratively and teamwork and, you know, older kids with the younger kids and just so good. And also the other thing that came to mind is uh, in October later, later this year, I'm actually doing exactly that. So I'm bringing six corporate companies together for a pickleball tournament but I'm running a workshop in the morning on cross pollination of different companies. So, um, so it's the first time I've done that and you're hundred percent right. The future is innovation and engagement. So on that note, my final question I wanted to ask you and it's something that you brought up again, I know we hadn't caught up, caught up for a while. So we did have a good off air chat uh, as well, but th this thing around impacting at a higher level, whether it be on a board, women, women getting women on a board to have an impact at a level where real sustainable change can happen, whether it be in sport or in the workplace. But why is that important uh, in the future and now? Through lived experience of this, it's sort of like no matter how much great work we can do in the community and in our clubs and in our workplaces, Ultimately, if we don't have the backing and the support of the big decision makers in our organisation or in our sports club or in our leagues, then I don't want to say that work goes to waste, but it the impact that it has on and the change that it has is quite minimal. So if we don't have, you know, all these pieces of the puzzle and I, during my time of being a PhD student, um, I sort of got exposed to how complex this problem is, that it's not its not a, just a click of the fingers, let's get more women and girls playing sport. You know, it's, it's impacted by every element of our daily lives. You know, I t talk to my daughter about when we go to the shops and we buy a birthday card for a five-year-old. If you look at the types of birthday cards that are for girls versus boys, girls are pink, flowery, love hearts. They've got words on them like soft and lovely. The boys are all superheroes and cars and trucks and the action things. So it's intertwined in our daily lives and it's so complex that we, what I'm seeing here in Melbourne is there's so many people doing such great work, men and women advocating for change and equality and, um, really trying really hard on those sort of day-to-day -day tasks and leadership in, in the clubs and workplaces. But unless that it sort of flows upwards or, you know, the, and the decisions support what's going on, it's, it just, it just stops. It, it's really that, um, you know, in the theoretical lens, they talk about it as a glass ceiling that there's great stuff going on in, in the lower sort of levels of, everything but until we see policy and structure and systematic change and support and funding which is a huge one we where it's it's limited and that I think that that's the bit that I'm starting to realize for me now as we move into this era this new sort of post-COVID era I think the critical element has to be um, we've done so much upskilling of women and that's great and let's keep that up. But it's now the men who support the women. And there's loads and loads of my time in sport and in business. I've had so many great men as advocates. We need to figure out how to empower them and give them the toolkit to they believe in it and they support us, but how can they advocate to other men? So it's really pulling that other lever that I still think is a little bit untouched and a little bit like there's a lot of side conversations that happen with men that say, I support you, this is great, we want to help. And they often say, how can we help? So it is about us now putting some effort in to think about building some toolkits, educating men and to, you know, to really advocate on women's behalf. And then also it's about us, you know, often we hear of this concept, the pale male stale um, sort of 
the other word that gets thrown around a lot here is dinosaurs. Well, those men that hold a lot of power in our sport and, and workplaces and how do we bring them on the journey and, and get them to a an open mindset, a growth mindset of learning and changing? Um, and I think it comes back to the point we were just talking about of that best practice, cross-pollination, you know, seeing who's doing it great, how have they done it, you know, how do we get our communities working collaborative, collaboratively to support everyone, not just women and girls? You know, we know there's lots of other intersectionality of inclusion, um, but the greater that we can empower everyone to make the change and, and it has to be everyone. It's not the women and girls issue. It's not just women and girls to solve. It's got to be everyone because, like I say, there's no point at just being this small, well, it's not even 50% of the population that don't hold a lot of the power positions. It has to be everyone working towards it. Well, Jules, hey, everyone, you've heard it from her very passionate advocating voice uh, to help all of us do a better job um, within our communities to create inclusive club environments with scaffolding um, in our daily coaching. Be mindful of your assumptions and your expectations. Uh, make sure that we use we language to bring each other along with self-worth and confidence so that we can work together uh it's been just i i could talk to you <laughs> more and more and more but uh you know based on how long people listen to podcasts we better wrap it up um but <laughs> jules hey uh you're you're just a you're a legend and uh i please rec recommend just people reach out get in touch because she has so much to offer sport and and the workplace and i can't wait to continue to watch you step into your greatness as as a coach as a leader and uh, thank you for being on the coaching podcast. Thanks, Emma. And thank you also for being such a great advocate of everything inclusion in sport. You're an awesome mentor and I love chatting to you today. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. The Coaching Podcast is sponsored by Transition Coach for Athletes, a global coaching, mentoring and U.S. college sporting scholarship placement service. The service helps athletes navigate the often challenging world of choosing your best college fit while maximizing sports performance. Visit www.transitioncoachforathletes.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating review on your podcast listening device. And don't forget to tell a fellow coach about the show. The ball is in your court to take action and enjoy your coaching. <laughs>